Welcome to Progenesis Academy webinar session 33. Today's topic is managing quality control and quality assurance in the IVF laboratory. And today we are really thrilled to have a three wonderful laboratory directors. We have Dr. Wimmer. He is the uh, lab director at Poma Fertility. We have Kristen Ivani. She is the um, laboratory director at uh, RS RSC Reproductive Science Center in the Bay Area, now uh, going uh, to be uh, retired, I think, uh, in the last uh, few days. I think, I think she's going through that phase. And we have um, Bill Vignier. He is the lab director at San Diego Fertility Center, also co-founder and trainer at the World Embryology Skills and Training. Thank you so much for attending and for participating in the webinar. Thank you so much. And so uh, we have three presentations. Um, each uh, presenter will talk about slightly different topic, but all of them are related to quality control and quality assurance. And Riley, if you can uh, uh, set up the uh, presentation so we can get started. Yep, I think Dr. Weimer has the control to the screen now. Okay, very good. Okay. Hang on just a second. Here we wait. Whoop, whoop. I see what you mean. Okay. Thanks everybody for being here today. Um, I'm going to talk about just a small aspect of quality control. And I'm going to talk about a subject that is near and dear to me, but also drives us completely crazy and that is pH. pH is one of those things that we learned early on in freshman college, but to this day uh, still plagues us a lot. And why is pH really important? Well, for those of you that are just becoming embryologists, um, oocytes and embryos really cannot regulate their pH. They, uh, they can't regulate intracellular pH until they become blastocysts. So if you can't regulate the pH of the embryos, this can have a really uh, large impact on the embryo development. It can impact blastomere development. It can uh, attribute to fragmentation, no cleavage. And it can really have a pretty big impact on, on overall how the embryos develop in culture. So I want to break down uh, the pH of uh, setting up pH in, under the auspices of a culture system with three points here. And that is that we have equilibration, we have the set points, and we have stabilization. So for example, um, e equilibration is the amount of time that culture media takes to absorb CO2, whereas the set point is the amount of time that once this media is starting to absorb CO2, that the buffer becomes fully saturated. And then stabilization is what we're all really looking for. And these are just fluctuations that are going to occur in media once the embryo has become fully uh, e equilibrated. So what are things that can impact um, <clears throat> equilibration? Oil viscosity, the amount of oil that's uh, in the dish, specifically the amount covering the top of the drops, the size of your culture drops, and even the type of protein can have a big impact on the amount uh, or how long it takes for uh, dishes to equilibrate. So this slide is just some data that we did early on with SafeSense and this illustrates the impact of oil and no oil. So the, the green uh, line shows how fast media equilibrates when we don't have oil. Whereas you can see here when we have a really viscous oil or not as a viscous oil, that it can approach you know, well over six hours before we start to see a shift in pH. So this is just a simple graph showing that pH uh, is greatly affected by the amount of, or by the viscosity of the oil. I wanted to show you this also, just simply that uh, how long oil can take. So this was in a mink incubator with a safe sense continuous application and we can see here during this equilibration period that it actually took almost 19, 19 hours for our culture media to reach pH equilibration according to the safe sense data. 
So basically what this has really told us is that if we start setting up dishes at the end of the day, like we used to, they're really not avail use, uh, useful until the next day. So as a result of this, we've now started to uh, make our culture dishes first thing in the morning and give them at least 19 hours uh, to equilibrate. This, uh, just the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go through really quick, just showing you what affects uh, CO2 happens. So for this is a CO2 incubator with just a thermal conductor uh, sensor. You can see that with frequent openings that the pH and the blue lines really is all over the place. Whereas with infrequent openings, we still have quite a bit of pH change that occurred over these days. Whereas when we're working with more of an infrared type sensor, Again, you can see that really with no matter how much our openings are, that our pH is staying in, in, in equilibrate or in physiological ranges. So when you're looking at the QC aspect in your lab, things like the type of CO2 sensors are gonna impact how long it takes for your dishes to equilibrate and stabilize. So the type of sensor is really important to know. That's the take home message here. Whereas here, this is what happens with more today a benchtop opening. What we were doing was that we were opening the, the dishes for a uh, lid for 30 seconds and closing and then opening and we were doing this. And you can see here that over the course of the experiment that our pH was going up and down, but again was staying very relative to what would be physiologically okay for our embryos. And you can see that even leaving it up to one minute uh, open and then closing for 30 seconds in A, B, C, you could see again that our pH is staying in here. So again, these three slides are really showing us that stabilization of our incubators are really dependent a lot upon the type of incubators and also the type of sensors that are within these incubators. So <clears throat> what can affect uh, pH levels? Uh, we talked about equilibration, We've talked about all of these following things like CO2 sensors. Obviously the location of your uh, HVAC outlets can have an impact uh, on the temperature changes that are within the in incubator itself. Remember, cooler spots are gonna be in the lower part of the incubator than upper parts. And obviously if you get bacterial contamination, this is gonna impact equilibration of media. One thing I do want to spend some time though talking about is humidity. So here we did again an experiment with SafeSense and we looked at an overlay of 35 micro, microliters and 50 microliters. And basically we chose these because this represents roughly about how much media or oil I should say is over the apex, the top of a droplet. And the bottom line is when we only have 35 microliters of oil, we could see that the osmolarity changed almost 100 units when the dishes were kept in culture over 30 days or over seven days, I should say. Whereas uh, when we had 50 microliters, the osmolarity change was virtually undetectable. It was only about three and a half. Let's try this one more time. And this uh, slide here shows the same thing. So we took GPS dishes and we had anywhere from five to 12 mLs of oil over 30 microliter droplets with humidity, without humidity. And you can see that how much the dish changed in mass with humidity and how much the mass the dish changed without humidity. And so you can see that in both culture systems, we are losing uh, water, we're having evaporation, but you can see that when we only have five to six mLs of water, or, or I should say oil, that the amount of evaporation is pretty great. So as a result of this with GPS dishes, we're adding somewhere between 11 and 12 uh, mLs of oil, and we wanna make sure that we have at least one to two mLs of oil over the apex of the drop to reduce the amount of evaporation that we're going to get. But it's good to know that even in humidified incubators, and in this uh, data, we were using planar incubators that we still had quite a bit of evaporation. So just in, in conclusion for my lecture, a part of the lecture, I just want to say that we really have to have a sufficient amount of, of mineral oil to protect 
from pH changes because it, uh, and, and sufficiently caused by evaporation, the effects of humidity are great. And these changes are gonna occur over a prolonged period of time. So it's really cognizant that we make sure that our culture dishes are set up correctly. And I would suggest setting up mock dishes and weighing the dishes to see what do they weigh at the end, at the beginning of the first day and the se say seventh day of culture. And that'll give you a pretty good idea of how much evaporation you're having in your, uh, in your culture system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, now we're gonna have the next speaker. Dr. Ivani, thank you so much. Okay, are we ready to go, Riley? Yes. Okay. I'm trying to. Okay. Um, well, thank you to Nabil and Riley and the whole Progenesis team for continuing to put on these amazing webinars and for hosting this great panel. This is a topic we were talking earlier that um, any of these could be a really an entire day's discussion. So we're, we're gonna buzz through this pretty quick. How do we measure quality in the IVF lab? Um, it, it's really a series of, of systems with um, quality management that includes quality assurance, uh, which then envelops quality control and quality improvement, as well as the KPIs or key performance indicators. And we can measure things in the lab and we can determine outcomes in the lab, but if you look on the right-hand side with the wise cats, there are a lot of confounding factors that in the IVF lab, we don't necessarily have control over, such as age, FSH, AMH, number of cycles, uh, the patients previously done, the number of eggs retrieved. So all of these can be confounding, um, confounding factors. Why do we even bother with this? Why, why are we concerned about this? Well, QA and QC should be part of our overall quality management program. It allows us to do benchmarking in the laboratory. It helps us ensure the safety and quality of care for our patients. And it allows the continued pursuit of excellence and improvement, which is something we should always be striving for. And if you take home anything from this, total quality management is a philosophy and a culture in your program. It requires full engagement, um, full participation from the clinical side, from the lab side. It's not a list that you check off or boxes. It really is a culture. And this, this quote from Atul Gawande, for those of you who have read his book, um, he says, better is possible. It does not take genius. It takes diligence. It takes moral clarity. It takes ingenuity. And above all, it takes a willingness to try. So these are a list of common KPIs that we measure in the, in the IVF lab. Some uh, may do more than this, some do fewer than this, depends on if you transfer day three, day five. But most of the time we're measuring fertilization rates, ICSI survival rates, cleavage rates, usable blast rate, which is the number of blastocysts that are either frozen or transferred divided by the number of 2PNs, cryo survival rate, Implantation rate by freeze tech, thaw tech, ET tech. We actually take it a step farther and look at biopsy tech because we want to ensure that our biopsy procedure is not impacting implantation for the frozen embryo transfers. And we look at um, ET physician as well as the physician of record because a physician of record is often the one making the decisions for the patient's treatment plan. We look at um, PGT no call rates and, um, and of course live birth rates. So let's take these a little bit one at a time. So first, um, QA, QC uh, allows us to do benchmarking in the IVF lab. And this slide is an example of our ICSI fertilization rate at Reproductive Science Center. So on the left-hand side, this is 2020 ICSI fertilization rates for um, all technicians that are, that are currently doing ICSI. And this is all ages of patients, all cycles, including um, uh, testicular biopsy type cases. 
So you can see this is a pretty tight, um, a pretty tight range here, which we're really happy about. But when you look at this on a regular basis, you can see if somebody is doing really, really well, you think, wow, I want to find out what that person's doing. At the same time, if you have somebody who's struggling a little bit, um, you can use this information to look at, um, you know, is it just because they had a few lower quality cycles or are they really struggling with equipment or technique? Um, the graph on the right hand side shows our ICSI fertilization rate from 2000 to 2020, and it's almost 11,000 ICSI cycles. So in 20 years, um, you know, we ranged from 62 to 84 uh, percent. Right now, we're averaging about 83, 84 percent. I have no idea why we got better at it. Um, I will say occasionally we've brought people into our lab who were better than average, and it actually made everybody uh, kind of step up their game. Uh, you've probably heard the term control charts. This is a version of a control chart. So doing QA, QC also allows us to do monitoring. Um, this is an HCG report that we put out to the physicians uh, every two weeks. And this, because we are mostly a frozen embryo transfer program and mostly PGT, this is um, positive HCGs in 2020. And we do this every two weeks and you think, well, wow, that line is all over the place, but, but really it's not because the, the red lines are, are pretty tight. And each dot on there represents about 50 cycles. So it's a good number of cycles. And this allows us to kind of, you know, when, when I first started doing IVF and we would look at things monthly and quarterly and annually, and boy, if you have a problem, it's too late to fix something. And if you're looking at things on a more regular basis, it gives you a lot more opportunity to stay on top of things and, and look for trends or look for potential problems. Um, this is the usable blast rate. This also is done every two weeks. And um, we look at this to determine, you know, obviously HCGs are gonna kind of come uh, after usable blast rate. But if you look at on the left-hand side, we had a dip in late January, which we call one of life's big mysteries because you all have been there where you look and look and look and you can't find anything. Um, we also had this dip in August, which as you know, um, we had a lot of wildfires in California. And in spite of the excellent air quality system, we still had air getting into the lab and into the clinic. Um, and that's what we're attributing that to. And this is gonna fluctuate a little bit but it should be pretty consistent. And you can see the average is right around, you know, 51 to 52%. Uh, this is one of my favorite things about doing QA is it allows this continued pursuit of excellence. And in 2012, our practice really set a goal that we wanted to be champions of ESET. And so we went about that by, um, setting some goals. So in 2012, you can see our goal was in patients under 35, we wanted 30% of them to have an ESET. We thought that, that was a pretty aggressive goal back then. 50% of egg donation patients. Now we're in a non-mandated state and patients were paying cash for cycles and they really weren't interested in being part of a little project to see if we could get them pregnant with one embryo versus two. So we sometimes would offer patients a free frozen embryo transfer cycle to try to get them to do an ESET. Um, and it was, it was difficult, but you can see what, our, what we did in 2012. Actually, we did 41% and 61% with, um, with egg donation. So we felt pretty good about that. And so you can see as we go down through the years, we increase the goal. And that's what you should be doing. You should make the goal harder to achieve. It shouldn't be something that you achieve every month. So we changed it to 40% in patients under 38. And you can see then we raise it to 50% and then 60%. And we continued to surpass the goal. But this also pointed us in the direction of looking at what is our service platform that we're offering for patients now? Because we're really not doing fresh transfers. So these numbers were for fresh transfers. And so we set a different goal for 2020 that we wanted 100% of all patients having their first frozen embryo transfer with a euploid embryo to have, to have a single embryo transfer. So that's a pretty aggressive goal and our, and our actual goal was 99%. So the point of this is that your QA program should be always evolving and you should always be looking at it 
and, um, and continuing to strive for excellence. So when we looked at the data, you know, one of the things patients were concerned about was, well, my pregnancy rate's gonna go down if I transfer only one embryo. And this table on the right-hand side starts in 1999. We did 1.8% single embryo transfer. We had a live birth rate of whopping 35%, woohoo. Um, but if you go down to 2019, you'll see the number of fresh embryo transfers has gone down because we do a lot of PGT, but the single embryo transfer rate is now 91%. If you look at 2018, you know, the, the live birth rate almost doubled and our single embryo transfer rate went from, you know, 2% to 87%. So Clearly we're doing something right here, but again, it's that pushing and striving for excellence, pushing your system so that you can get the best outcomes for the patients. And these graphs on the right-hand side, or on the, sorry, on the left-hand side, just show that in a graphical form. Um, we're also able to do external monitoring. And this is some PGT data from our program on the left-hand side, we look at no call rate. So this is RSC compared to this um, genetics labs data from the entire United States. So the, the provider had a 2% no call rate and our call rate, it, it says it was zero. It was actually 15 embryos out of about 3,100 embryos. So it was 0. I mean, yeah, 0. 0.48%. But you kind of want to know how you're doing compared to the rest of the or the rest of the world, the rest of the country, and and this is no small number of embryos. And you can see on the bottom the average number of embryos that we biopsy per month is 257. So it's a good number, and each patient has an average of five embryos um, for each cycle. And then we look at the euploidy rate. So we're doing you know pretty comparable to the rest of the United States, which is good to know. But these are the types of things that, um, that help us to make positive changes in our program when you have something to compare it to. And we wouldn't be a great QA talk if we didn't talk a little bit about risk management, but this can actually be, uh, as you all know, a seminar unto itself. Um, really three, three keys here, an incident report, which is a recording of facts that were related to an accident, injury, or some sort of near miss. It's not meant to be punitive. It's meant to really uncover circumstances and conditions that led to this incident so you can prevent them in the future. Um, a more proactive um, approach would be using the FMEA or failure modes and effects analysis. And then finally, a root cause analysis, which is, um, is a reactive process, really trying to identify what went wrong. I put these references in here not to go through, but only only to provide the, the attendees with some background information. If you're looking to learn more about setting up key performance indicators or a QA program in your, in your uh, practice, I would highly recommend looking at these papers. And then at the bottom, uh, David Mortimer and Sharon Mortimer even have an entire book on quality and risk management in the IVF lab. And it's a great tool to have. And as my wise friend, Alex Barash says, you can only improve things that you can measure. So wash your paws and wear your mask. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, next speaker is Bill, Bill Vinier. Thank you so much. Okay, so here we are. First of all, thanks a lot, Nabil, uh, for putting this together and Riley for all your, your work in uh, getting us in one spot and uh, for putting me on such a, a great panel with uh, two of the best in the business. So thanks so much. I don't know why we're going the wrong way here, but let's see if I can go back. There we go. Second. Great. I think it's 
I can grow an embryo, but I can't work a computer. Okay. Okay, training. So uh, I, I uh, picked training as my uh, QC, QA um, bit in, uh, in the laboratory that we have to pay close attention to. Uh, and of course, with training, uh, there's three different types of training. There's newbies, so someone that has no experience whatsoever. We have uh, someone you bring in that you hired that was previously somewhere else or someone that is uh, per diem, that's just helping you out part-time, those types of things. So they're kind of treated a little bit different, uh, but the main thing is they have to get used to all your policies and procedures. One, safety, OSHA, hazardous material, chemical hygiene plan, uh, then interaction with patients, physicians, uh, lab personnel. So all that uh, kind of feeds into the whole training program itself. So what is the plan? Well, you have to make a plan, right? You got to figure out who's going to be the mentors of the, the trainees. Uh, it could be more than one person. Um, so it just depends on the, the time and scheduling of the day. You got to really highlight the fact that the trainee is responsible for getting this done. Uh, it, it, it's tough these days on labs, high volume labs to get the training done. So the trainee may have to do stuff after hours. They may have to ask a senior person, hey, can you stay an extra hour with me and work on this? Um, you expect them to have a journal on what they're doing on a daily basis. So you can review that on a weekly, bi-weekly basis and see where they started and where they are today and what needs to be done. Uh, where do we get material for training? So. Usually you start out with uh, mouse embryos and those types of things, at least in the, in the early days, that's what we did. Um, nowadays, um, you know, if you don't have it in your consents, you should have it in your consents that uh, you'll use the patient's discarded material uh, for training pur uh, purposes up, for 20, up to 24 hours. Um, I think uh, that should probably be something common in there. Can they cross it out and say no? Sure, they can, but um, I would put it in there as kind of a, a general statement and let them cross it out um, as opposed to signing off on it. Just my opinion on that type of thing. Um, but you know, there's a lot of degenerated material just to move around and get used to pipetting uh, and the basics. So. Uh, another main thing to look at is benchmarks. So not only like what is the goal, but what is the minimum standard? So if you're working with someone and they can't achieve the minimum standard, then you wouldn't, you shouldn't even move on. They're not, they're not cut out for it. Um, but have a minimum standard. They're re reaching those standards, and then you set their goals. You know, loftier goals like. Um, Kristen said, you know, make them uh, a little bit uh, uh, out, out of reach, so to speak, uh, and, and push them towards that. So, you know, what, whatever the, the best senior embryologist doing or best embryologist overall, what their rates are, and that, that's what you're striving to do. Or when you see someone put up something in a conference or a talk like this, and you're like, wow, those ICSI rates are looking really good. Why are we satisfied with 80 when we can get close to 85? So those types of things, um, you have to make sure you add to your training program and your competency after your training. So again, documentation, that's really up to the trainee. Get stuff document, documented, but you want to have a form that's all signed off on. The trainee, the trainers, and the lab director um, need to sign off. And then a follow-up, like you don't just train someone and then you know throw them out the pasture and let them work with the rest of the herd. You gotta you gotta see what's going on. So I would say you know a three-month, six-month follow-up for for the newbies, um, and then that continues 
follow through to today to uh, being a senior embryologist slash lab director. If you're working in a lab, you need peer review uh, on a yearly basis. So here's just something that, uh, this is what our kind of training outline looks like. Uh, it's a little bit different for someone that is already trained and comes in, and it's a little bit different for per diem people. But you have your evaluation factor, which is your, your daily activities, your daily procedures. And then your competency standards, you want to set what those are. You want to uh, put in the next column the date that that person actually performed in competence. So the journal is used like, hey, I've done 25 retrievals. No one has found an egg on me. So I'm ready to, to be signed off on my competency on that. So that's where that date would go in. And then uh, a six month evaluation and then a one year evaluation for the, the newbies in the lab. Uh, we do the same thing for our uh, yearly compensation. I mean, uh, yearly competency um, is an annual review. You can always look at uh, proficiency testing results. I am not high on proficiency testing results for the embryology lab. They're just not uh, that well done, unfortunately. Uh, KPIs are big. So Kristen talked about that. Uh, and, and that's the main thing to look at is KPIs and then, uh, you know, watch the person. Uh, if you have an outlier, you know, have that person um, assess who the best is, um, assess them, have them assess others. You know, are they drifting? Have they learned one way and all of a sudden drifted to something else, which is, it, it, that easily happens. So that's why you got to keep up with those KPIs and those benchmarks and make sure everyone is on the same page doing the same thing. Uh, if things are tweaked a little bit, but those KPIs are solid all the way through, that's fine. But as soon as someone drifts out um, and, and there's an outlier, you know, you have to look at all the, the details of what's going on um, with that one procedure. Uh, do they need to be retrained completely? Highly unlikely, maybe some newbies that, you know, are in their six month to a, a year thing. Uh, probably not much uh, on the senior end of things, but we've done, we have had some issues with seniors. So I'll go to those, um, these examples that I'm showing right now, I'll discuss those um, in the, the Q and A period. Uh, but the main thing uh, to finish up with is you got to compare apples to apples. You're going to have people in the lab like, oh, I've gotten all the 44-year-olds and I don't get any of the egg donors. Well, when you do your KPIs, you know, you break your egg donors as, as one of the uh, factors, main factors to look at. You can look at uh, the, everything overall for, every, uh, for all the work these uh, embryologists are doing, but break it into egg donors also. So that's comparing apples to apples um, in my eye. So don't forget about the physicians. <laughs> we need to assess the physicians uh, and making sure they're doing stuff, even though they, they may, may not do things uh, exactly the same in, in embryo transfers um, or in stimulations, but um, you know, let's make sure we assess what's going on there too, in case there's some outliers there. So a um, couple of uh, kind of references like Kristen had, the Vienna Consensus 2017 is awesome to look at for benchmarks and that, that type of thing. Um, and I'm going to to Kristen's horn and uh, my wife, Debbie Benier, I think put something to, together for uh, uh, the CRB. So uh, take a look at that also. And I think uh, that's it for me. And thanks again for having me. Thank you so much, Bill. Thank you for this great presentation. 
Um, I'm going to start my first question. So you, all, all you guys, the three of you are wonderful lab directors with a lot of experience. If you were acting as a cap inspector, what would you look at, the first thing you would look at in a lab, uh, red flags, what that would be? And I'll start with you, Klaus. That's a great question. Um, first thing I would do is if I looked, if I did a, if I did a lab inspection and I saw, for example, that there were no incidents reports, I'd be like, wow, this place is, you know, either running really, really amazing or they're not writing down anything that are going on. So then I would just look for worksheets like, you know, where's your pH worksheets? Where's your worksheets where you're doing all your quality control and QC? You know, th those would be the kind of things that I would be looking for to see, you know, where's your work in progress? What's going on in the lab? You know, I've been to a couple of labs where there was zero incidence reports in like five years, but yet their pregnancy rates were not so good or they had no fertilization and things like that. And you're like, well, why aren't these things being addressed in a proactive way as a group, but not as a way, you're not there to, uh, you know, put, throw somebody under a bus, but rather use these as an opportunity to learn from, you need to formally document these so that you have these in the book for your inspectors to come in and see that when incidences occur, you use those as a learning opportunity. And monitoring all the uh, pH, temperature, and all these things? Absolutely. That goes without saying. You know, you should be seeing, like a lot of people today are using a, a wonderful app called Reflection. So if I didn't see clipboards around, you know, with temperatures, monitoring, things like that, you'd go, well, where do you monitor all this? And if they said, well, here's our reflections, you know, you can look on their notebook or within the virtual app and see everything, but you you would definitely want to see that there's work in progress like that going on. Thank you. Uh, Kristen, what's your uh, perspective? If you if you were a cap inspector, what first thing you would like to see in a lab? How, how would you go about finding those weaknesses in a lab? And I think you're muted. Uh, okay. I like to see collaboration between the laboratory group and the physician group. Um, I think that really strengthens your program. It strengthens, um, it, it makes your whole quality management program more robust. And because we, we can't operate in a silo, you know, we need each other. And I think that relationship is, is really key. So I like to see that. Um, some type of quality counsel or quality reporting um, that that combines the two because you know Bill touched on it a little bit we we can't obviously control everything with stimulation and things the physicians are doing but I think that communication between the two groups is really key um, I also think that acting on trends or things that you see it's great. You can have clipboards or reflections and wherever your, your QC data is being monitored from. But if you don't identify a problem or act on a problem that you see, I, I think that that is a real issue. Very good. Thank you so much. Uh, Bill, if you were doing cap inspection, what would you be looking at as far as red flags in a lab? Oh. One is getting in the lab. Now I've tried to inspect or didn't inspect the lab that, and according to them, and this is a, a, a big lab and according to them, and they've been around a while, they have never been during an inspection, have they been asked uh, to allow the inspector to go into the lab. I was, my jaw dropped and I'm like, ah, I don't understand that type of thing. So that, that, that's, that's a major red flag right off the bat. Um, you, you know, I, I look for safety alarms, stuff, those types of things um, are probably high on my list. Um, yeah, and just seeing the, the, the workflow, uh, the equipment, the room, uh, air handling, 
all those types of things. I mean, Klaus hit uh, on some some perfect stuff as well as Kristen. So I, I don't have that much to add, but yeah, mm -hmm. you 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 want to see the day to day, not that you're again, not that you're going to nitpick like, oh, you're doing it the wrong way because this is how we do it. No, you're you're just making sure you know, uh, hey, is everything up to snuff in that lab? Uh, safety first, you know. Uh, for the patient outcome, for the for the employees themselves, uh, it, it just it just blew my mind that this this lab wouldn't let me in. <laughs> to to add to what Christine said, you know, I think it's important for everybody to understand that she did a great job of emphasizing that. But to all the new lab directors out there, the more that you can cooperate with the nursing staff and the physician staff and work on problems as a team, the better your changes are that are gonna occur. And when something happens, in, include everybody on it. You know, it's not just a lab issue, it's a clinic issue. And I think Christine brought out a point that it, it cannot be overemphasized enough. It's cooperation is really key to all this. Thank you so much. Uh, Klaus, how do you define a good quality control, a quality assurance program? How that program should look like? Oh, wow. <laughs> you, you can well, summarize it. That actually, the way, the way that I've, the labs that have got good quality control programs are labs that have learned how to learn from the problems that they have had in the past and have now put safeguards in to measure those. That's number one. Number two, what separates the Super Bowl winning teams from the rest of the teams are the laboratories who can anticipate the problems that are gonna occur based upon the problems that they've had in the past. So in other words, Christine brought up a good thing. She saw that they were gonna to start to do embryo biopsy more and more and more. So she immediately incorporated the, the person who's doing the biopsies as a quality control aspect. She did not wait for her to start getting no reads she anticipated that there's gonna be some issues that are gonna come up now that they're doing biopsies. So she anticipated whatever problems could be and found out ways to measure them. So that's an example of really proactive because you have to have two things. You have to be proactive and then you're looking back in retrospect, but it's a proactive QC that's really gonna help you a lot. If you're waiting till you have negative pregnancy tests to start fixing things, then you're already, what, 10, 12 days behind. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Kristen, so the same question, how do you define a good quality control and quality assurance program? And when it comes to training, or uh, uh, when it comes to tracking uh, performance of laboratory personnel, uh, do you see any resistance of the, you know, of the technicians not being willing to be tracked or, or something like that? Um, that's a good question. I'm going to say no. We see no resistance to that. And I and it gets back to what I had said in one of my first slides, that this is it's a culture and a philosophy. And it's a culture in the practice. And as Klaus and, and Bill have both said, you know, you need to engage the laboratory, the clinicians, the nursing staff. So I, you know, our QA program in the laboratory is incorporated into our clinics QA program. And we report quarterly um, to what we call the medical executive committee, which is, you know, would basically be a, a QA committee. So I think there needs to be, you know, there needs to be a plan. Like Bill said, you need to have goals, you need to have accountability, you need to have reportability. Uh, and I think it is important that as part of our orientation, we, talk about that culture with new staff and we want them to be a part of it and we want them to participate in it. So I think that that, um, that really helps a lot. But I think you need to have measurable goals. They need to be monitored on a regular basis. They need to be evaluated on a regular basis because you can collect all the data in the world, but if you don't do anything with it, it it's just really a waste of time, whether it's in the cloud or on a clipboard, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, we can have volumes and volumes of pages or, or um, lots of stuff up in the cloud, but we need to use it. And 
You know, I, I'll give you another, just a quick example, you know, that seemed like for a little while years ago, we were having a higher number of average than retained embryos. So what's your goal for retained embryos? You know, obviously you don't want any, but sometimes that's impossible. So, you know, we set a benchmark, we monitored it for a couple of years that we didn't have an issue with it anymore. So we stopped monitoring it. But what we also did at that same time was look at what was the pregnancy rate in those patients that had retained embryos was no different than, than patients who didn't. Now, obviously we don't want retained embryos, but to, to understand okay, this is a situation that we saw as an issue we wanted to address. We came up with a plan to address it, but we also recognized that it really didn't have a clinical impact, um, helped us to, to understand a little bit better. Thank you so much. Um, Bill, how does a good quality control and good quality assurance look like to you? So um, Klaus hit uh, the nail on the head there with, um, incidents, like follow-up to incidents, uh, so they, they're not repetitive. So that, you know, he used a, he used a football analogy there. I thought the answer was Tom Brady, but I got lost. There. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's making sure there's not repetitive accidents uh, of the same thing or repetitive uh, um, issues with uh, whatever it is, fertilization rates, pregnancy rates, you know, what was the course of action you took? What was the, uh, you know, uh, Kristen referred in one of her slides to uh, the root cause analysis type of stuff. So uh, what did you do to come to that? Um, and what are you doing to prevent it from happening in the future? Um, I think a major statement to make for someone new coming into our lab um, or, or our program overall, we're human beings. We're going to make mistakes. It's how we handle those mistakes. You want to be transparent about it. Don't be afraid to say something. Okay. So, and our physicians buy into that. They're, it could be very toxic going to a, to a physician that's going to blow his, his or her head off because, uh, you know, something happened with a, a transfer or a fertilization rate or something along those lines. So I think you gotta be transparent. You gotta put this, this stuff in incident reports and, and what you did and, and what you're doing to prevent it. It's gonna happen and it's gonna continue to happen. Nobody is perfect. So I think if you just, you know, give them, you know, so a, a breath to take and not be afraid to report something I think is a major factor. Thank you so much. Uh, Klaus, what quality control and quality assurance uh, purpose should be, or goal should be, uh, uh, improvements of IVF outcome or consistency, maintaining consistency in the laboratory through monitoring all the conditions or avoiding major failures in the laboratory? I think it's kind of all of the above of what you mentioned. You obviously want to put steps into place to avoid any major mishaps. But the way you want to go about doing this is that you, you want to be looking at the conditions within your laboratory and you need to understand the physiology well enough to know, are my conditions from day zero to day six, for example, are my conditions optimized? So you should set into place to be able to measure that you know, to, to, to ensure that, for example, the temperature and the pH is correct in that. And so then, so, that, so you should constantly be working on your protocols to make them better. Because if, you, if you're working on making them better, then you're going to improve the consistency. And if you improve consistency, you're going to improve number of blastocysts, which is going to increase your outcomes. And so hopefully work, all of those working together um, I don't think it's just one thing. I think it's a combination of everything, really, what, what you just mentioned. Thank you so much. Uh, Kristen? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that one builds on the other and, and feeds on the other, and that you, as your laboratory monitoring is consistent and predictable, um, so should be your outcomes are consistent and predictable for the most part. It's a little bit difficult and more difficult in a smaller program where you have smaller numbers, 
um, and you can have pretty big swings up in one direction or the other. But um, overall, your good quality management program should point you in the direction of, of keeping things consistent and keeping things simple. When I think about what our culture system was like, you know, 10 years ago compared to what it is now, it's super simple now and our outcomes are so much better. Um, you know, and so you need to, that, that's part of a quality assurance and quality improvement program is to continue to make things more efficient as well as improve your outcomes. But you really can't have one without the other. Thank you so much. Bill? Yeah. Yeah, I agree 100% with the, uh, with the other two. I'm just going to give you kind of an example of, you know, uh, we have to monitor everything. You know, Klaus took environment, Kristen took KPIs, I took training. Got to tie all that stuff in, in together. Um, but, uh, you know, one of my slides, I put up a, a couple of examples, so I'll refer to one of them. We had uh, an increase in no results on a newer genetic company that we were using. Um, and, a, and my first reaction, again, hindsight, I, I did the wrong thing, but I learned from it. So I went back to the genetic company, I'm like, hey, we didn't have this problem before. We have high no results with you. So probably within 24 hours, they came back and said, hey, it seems to be one of your techs. So, you know, I kind of felt a little, little bit bad that I was like blaming, as my first line of defense, I was blaming the genetic company when it wasn't. It was actually someone who drifted and was just not placing the, the biopsy cells uh, low enough in the PCR tube for the, the genetic testing. So, you know, it, it, it was uh, definitely a learning experience for me um, to do that. And I continue to learn to this day. Um, and, uh, you know, we had to reevaluate that, that that person and everything was fixed within, you know, a day or two. So um, those types of things. And your, um, uh, I'll get to that after, but your little uh, data that you asked for people to reply on. I replied that my QA QC system is okay and can be better. I don't think it's perfect. Uh -huh. uh, and I don't know. Again, we have to strive for perfection and get there, like Kristen said. So. And, and here we have the results of the poll. So first question was, are, you, are your quality control and assurance system up to date? 58% said 100%, yes. And 37% said they need improvements. 5% said they don't have a quality control or assurance program. Um, then we ask, are you currently monitoring the pH during um, embryo growth? 53% said yes, 26% said sometimes, and 21% said they don't monitor the pH. We also ask, do you currently use an alarm system to monitor temperature? And 28% um, monitor temperature in incubator. 19% in freezers, 16% in nitrogen tanks. And we're gonna go into the nitrogen tanks question in a few seconds. Then 79% um, said all the above. We ask what type of incubator do you currently use? Air ja jacket or water jacket? It was almost a split decision, 47 air jacket, 53 water jacket. Then we ask, what IDF lab outcome um, are you most concerned about? 51% said fertilization rate, 33, 33% ICSI survival rate, 30% cleavage rate, 51 usable plus rate, 35 cryo survival, 19% PGTA no call results, 63% implantation rate, which is the highest we've seen and a live birth, 49%, all the above 49. 
And last question was, how do you currently manage your documentation and policy and procedures? And 28% use a software-based solution. 67% are using only documentation on a computer, just files. And 5% don't have one. Um, Klaus, what do you make out of the poll results? What strike you the most in, in these answers? Permission to speak frankly, I'm amazed that 5% of IVF labs don't have a QC, QA program. That's just mind boggling. And the other thing that's super mind boggling is that 21% of people don't monitor pH for embryo growth when, I mean, we, anybody who works in physiology understands that embryo culture is greatly affected by temperature and pH. Um, all the other comments seem pretty straightforward, um, but I'm, I'm kind of concerned about the lack of QC and people doing pH, especially since over the years, we have really spoken a lot about quality control and pH. Thank you so much. Kristen? Um, I would agree with Klaus. I think that if you don't have any monitoring system in your laboratory, it's really difficult to get answers when you encounter problems, whether that be with a pH or staffing issues or fertilization rate. Um, I think that it, it's good to see the people monitoring a big variety of, of, of uh, KPIs. I think it's easy to kind of get bogged down in a lot of them, but I think you can eliminate things that don't really apply to you. Like we don't, you know, we don't check embryo cleavage, so we haven't monitored cleavage rates for many, many years, but, but you know, to look at the indicators and use them for something. I know we keep saying the same thing, but um, you know, you want to be able to measure something. It has to have an endpoint, and then what are you going to do with that? So, I think the um, you know a lot of those papers that I referenced in the in the last slide of my talk are super helpful to guide people if they want to get started. Um, it can seem really overwhelming, I and mean, you just start simply at first, and then you 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 build on that. Thank you so much. Bill? Yeah, I'm not sure I have much more to add to that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, as Klaus really stated, it is mind boggling. Uh, I mean, if you don't have a monitoring system for anything, I mean, QA, QC, you know, your equipment, um, uh, you know, how do you, how do you find out a, a problem until, until it's too late? And I mean, how many people is it going to affect? How many patients, you know, have to have a bad outcome before you start looking at, at something? So, um, yeah, I, I just think you're going to catch stuff too late if you don't monitor anything, uh, and you're going to affect more than one patient. So, so earlier I asked, what is the purpose of, uh, or the goal of the quality control and assurance? And one of the possible answers were to avoid major failures. So when you look at the, uh, the poll results in terms of priorities, the uh, tank, the nitrogen in the tank did not rank very high. And we are aware that there were a couple of incidences in IVF centers that causes a major problem both for, from, from patient care perspective and financial. Uh, was that a quality control, quality assurance issue, Klaus? Yeah. Well, that I was mean, He just solved all the problem. <laughs> I, just, I, I don't even know where to begin with that one, though. Yeah. Um, they were, yeah. I don't know. I got it. Can I think about that for a second? Christine, what do you think? Oh, sure. Put me on the spot. <laughs> um, well, without citing any names, where there, there, there have been many cases just to kind of neutralize that bias. Um, few places, not only one or two, would that be considered a QA, QC uh, problem? I, I would say absolutely yes. I think regardless of the type of tank system that you have, whether it's a a big giant paper tank or a, a bazillion, you know, 
six canister tanks. It's like everything else. You need to have a system in place. How are you monitoring them? Who's following up on the monitoring? Is there going to be a catastrophic failure? Could there be? Absolutely. There can always be a catastrophic failure of, of any piece of equipment. But you know, part of our QA plan, QI plan, is to look at safety issues, prevention issues. Um, for example, you know, I, I will admit, you know, I, I'm a dinosaur with a clipboard, and 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 I'm proud of that. But um, you know, we do monitor our liquid nitrogen tanks, and we have over you know years found a tank that started using more nitrogen than another tank, and we got rid of it. You know, no questions asked, and and that again kind of is back to the relationship with the physicians and the support and the importance of the program, is that. Hey, if I think if I'm suspicious about this, whether it's an incubator or a liquid nitrogen tank, I'm going to put it out of business and get a new one in that I can trust. And then before I bring that new one in, I'm going to test it and make sure that it works. So it's not just equipment. It's it's monitoring the equipment. It's knowing what the equipment's supposed to do. It's having the staff trained and committed to monitor the equipment to respond to the call, to know how to respond to the call if you have a calling system set up, which, which we all should. So it's, it's a multifaceted program. It's not an isolated one thing. Um, Bill? Yeah. Um, yeah, and you got to, you know, who, who is in charge of monitoring the tanks? Is it everybody or do you have one certain person that's dedicated to it. Um, and, and that's something you have to, th that may evolve into someone else doing it. So how does, you know, between the two, uh, you know, are they doing it exactly the same way? So there's, we have a lot of those 47 liter tanks. So if you don't put the dipstick down, straight down the middle into the little, there's a little hole there. So it's gonna drop a little bit further and sitting it uh, on where the canisters fit in. So you're gonna get different reads there. So if one day it's 38 and then you come back, uh, we do it every other day. So let's say Monday is 38 and you come back on Wednesday, it's 34. Well, did two different people measure it? Because then they, they didn't measure it the same way because it shouldn't drop that much. So that's what I, I would have them remeasure the tank uh, and make sure um, I'm training someone right now on it. So I, it's a it's a great point. So I tell them if you can, if you don't think you're get down the middle the whole time, then don't worry about it. But you're gonna your fill your fill uh, level is gonna be different than mine, so to speak. So you know you you just have to train the people to do it right. Uh, so you're, you are monitoring it correctly. So, uh, you know, those, those are important things is, is everyone doing it the same way? And if they're not, you can't treat it the same way. Cause then you're, you're, you're thinking a tank is failing and it's not. Yeah. What's great in my lab is we just had a tank fail, um, which is actually just a, a tipper tank that we use to, to use, uh, for our freezing to pour into a, a styrofoam box. Um, but it failed and it um, frosted on the top, it sweated on the, on the sides. So everyone got a good look at it, like, hey, this is the tank failing. So when you go over and do a check, we check twice a day, just visual checks twice a day on the tanks, AM and PM. So if you ever see anything frosting up or sweating, then there's a problem, you report it immediately. So it's just the training of the personnel and that was definitely a, a QC problem, those, those incidences. Uh, I mean, I'm sure we're not gonna find everything out, but you hear rumors of what happened. And if it happened that way, then there's negligence there. I mean, you can't just push that stuff aside and oh hum it. So it's, and you gotta train the, imp the importance of all this into the people that are doing it. I think what, what Bill just said is that that last point is so incredibly important. Train people about the importance of it and, and train them holistically. Um, you know, look at the tank. Is it sweating? Is it, 
um, you know, like this morning I pulled out a cork and it had a crack in it. Okay, we replaced the cork. And, you know, to be looking for things like that. It's the same with an incubator. You know, when you open it, what does it smell like? What does it look like inside? You know, is the gas bubbling? Is the water have floaties on it? Um, does it smell dry? Does it smell funky? I mean, don't for people to not just go through the motions of of filling out something or putting it in a computer, you know, to really look at the equipment and think this is a patient's family in here and I'm responsible for this and teach and train people to understand the importance of everything that they're doing in the lab, not just the heavy duty embryology stuff. And in, in terms of how you structure that team that will take care of the uh, quality control, quality assurance, how do you do that? Do you assign a few people the responsibility to lead and then chain or how from organization organizational perspective how does it work uh klaus so we we've trained everybody you know that's part of their initial indoctrination in the lab whether they work in andrology or embryology that you know for example things like environmental checks and things like that are done by everybody but but I think along with what Bill and Christine are talking about is that it's more establishing of a culture. If you train everybody to do these things and train them why these things are important and how they fit in the big picture, and if they have a question, then to come to somebody, which is kind of what the issue was with the tank failures, it was the original question. So when you asked me originally, is this a QC or, or a QA issue? It's more of a system failure in that people knew there were issues with tanks, yet it wasn't making it past a certain person because the culture was not established correctly in that clinic that yes, you may have 10 people trained to do something, but if something is out of kilter, even if it's on a Saturday or a Sunday, you need to reach out to somebody and ask for some help or ask for another opinion. And I think that's often why we have things like tank failures occur. So I think it has to be a system wide. Everybody has to be trained to do these things. Everybody's gonna know what their gasp, grasp of this subject matter is, and they have to be comfortable enough going to other people if they have questions, comments, or concerns. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how good your QC system is, you're gonna have a failure or an issue at some point. And would you have a chain of command, for example, the one that spot the issue will report it to a, certain, to a specific person, could be a CLS or, or a lab director. It would use- It depends on the size of the program. If you have a really giant IVF clinic, you know, with 30 people working in it, yeah. But typically something like that, you could go to anybody I know in my lab and I'm sure in any, in Christine or Bill's lab, it doesn't really matter who it is. If you go out and you check a tank, for example, and you find something wrong, you should come and tell the first person that you can find so that you can start working on this right away. And then it will eventually wake, make its way up the food chain. Yeah, thank you so much. Bill, exactly. yeah, if you wanna add something to it, also, if you wanna to touch base on the cost of implementing a good quality control quality assurance, is there any additional cost to the lab? And how do you justify that cost to the physician uh, as far as uh, decision? Okay. I don't think there's additional costs. Um, just referring back to Klaus and, you know, everyone does QC, everyone does quality control. However, then that goes up to, you know, quality management system. So we have, that would be, you know, a lab director, probably your lab supervisors, a lab manager, so to speak, mm -hmm. if there's an office manager there. And you usually have the medical director of your physician team as part of this. So um, I, I don't think there's additional cost there unless you're using some type of web-based thing that you're paying for. But other than that, you know, uh, there's no additional cost. I would say there's definitely a cost to not doing it as we've all <laughs> seen in the news, but you know, it, it should be, there should be a lot of resources provided for it, both manpower and whatever additional equipment um, that you feel you might need, you know, for monitoring. But the cost of not doing it is far greater than the cost of doing it, whatever that cost might be. 
Yeah, so when we ask the question, uh, are you using a uh, software-based system to do document control and do all the QA and QC metrics, only half said they were, they were using some sort of system. The others were using just like documents, uh, docu uh, you know, files on their computer. How do you guys feel about this, uh, Klaus? I'm fine with a paper. It doesn't really matter what your format is of collecting the data as long as you do something with it. So, you know, the advantage of having a tablet, for example, is it's going to dump it into Excel and it makes it really easy to download the data and look at it. But if you're somebody who's recording the data on paper and you put it into an Excel spreadsheet and you crunch the numbers, at the end of the day, crunching the numbers and looking at the trends, that's the most important thing. What method you use to collect the data is up to you. Do something with the data. Thank you so much, Kristen. I would agree with that. I think you can have a, a really fancy data collection system, but if you don't do anything with it, um, I don't think it's offering you a lot of advantage. I also feel like you need to still be looking at your equipment, you know, sticking your fingers in there, poking around and looking at it. And if something's, if everything's automatically measured, I think we may have some false sense of security that everything's okie dokie when uh, you know, we still need to be hands-on and looking at everything. Yeah. Uh, um, Bill, would you like to add something before we... I don't think I have much to add there. Again. Right. Yes. It, so next question... You're not monitoring and, uh, and uh, writing stuff down, documenting. You have nothing to go on. So, <laughs> so one great. of the questions we asked on, on the poll was, uh, do you use air jackets or do you use water jacket? And there is almost a 50-50% uh, split. Um, there are some studies that mention that one is better than the other. And I'm gonna pinpoint the presentation that Klaus made on the evaporation, and the importance of uh, humidity and, and, and level of oil and all that. How do you feel about air jacket versus water jacket, Klaus? Which one is better? Um. I think they're both really good. They both have advantages and disadvantages. The really nice thing about water jacketed incubators are if you're in an area that has power outages and things like that, a water jacketed incubator will, will, will keep all night if you don't open it. You know, it's going to hold its temperature really, really well. Um, the problem with water jacket and incubators, and again, I, I don't know if I'm being fair, is that the old ones that I used had a lot of hot and cold spots inside of them. I don't know if that was a function of the water jacket or the function of the heating elements. I find that the air jacketed ones are much, they come to temperature much faster. I, the newer ones, I don't find hot and cold spots in them. Um, but you know, if you lose power, they, 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 they lose their temperature much, much faster. So the water jacketed ones I feel are not as precise in temperature throughout the whole incubator as the air jacketed ones. But I don't know if it's because I'm comparing new to old. And is there any risk of pH fluctuation or temperature when you compare both? I haven't noticed anything more. The bigger thing is it, the method of, of humidification. Some of the big box incubators have active water bubblers, you know, in the humidifying chamber. So they rehumidify the incubator much faster, whereas some of the older incubators just have a pan that sits on a warm plate and then that heats up. And so those tend to lose humidity much faster than the active humidity chambers. So in that case, the active humidity chamber is going to impact humidity within your micro drops much more than just say a water pan that's sedentary and it loses a lot of humidity when you open it and then it takes time to build back up. Thank you so much. Bill? Uh, so yeah, it's kind of uh, what Klaus alluded to. You're comparing old with, with new. So I haven't used a water jacket and incubator since those big box ones. And, um, you know, these benchtop ones, 
uh, unless I, I could be unaware, but the, I don't know if any bench top incubator is water jacketed. But, um, you know, I think the main thing is the recovery when you open those doors. Um, it, it is probably the, the main pro and con of, of them. I think it takes a little bit longer for those big box ones to, to re equilibrate than the, than the bench top ones. Thank you so much. Uh, we are approaching the end of the webinar. We are just going to collect the last poll and then uh, maybe we'll let you guys introduce your organization. And so, and with that, we will uh, wrap up the webinar. Um, and I'll start uh, with you, Klaus, first. Um, my name is uh, Klaus Wiemer. I've been a lab director, oh gosh, now since about 19... 86 maybe, somewhere right around there. Um, I'm part of a practice called Palma Fertility up here in the Seattle, Washington area. If you're ever up here, we would love to have you come by and visit. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be on this webinar with great colleagues that I've known for many years, Bill and Christine, two of the best in the business. It's great to be on here with you guys. Thanks a lot for letting me be here. Thank you so much, Bill. Bill Venier, uh, I'm the Embryology Lab Director at uh, San Diego Fertility Center and uh, just started a, the World Embryology Skills and Training West in, uh, in San Diego also for training uh, newbies, new embryologists. We wanna introduce new people to the field and get them trained and ready to go work in the lab. Greatest job ever, I'm telling you. Thanks again for having me on with these Two amazing other lab directors. Thank you, thank you. Kristen? Uh, my name is Kristen. I am the former lab director at the Reproductive Science Center. And um, my, my goal, I've been promoted now to embryologist from lab director, so I might have to come down into the uh, West Training Center and <laughs> get trained to work in the lab. Uh, we have a seven physician practice in the San Francisco East Bay, about uh, 40 miles east of San Francisco. And um, like Bill said, it, it's just the greatest job ever, you know, working in the IVF lab. You, you can make a bigger difference in someone's life than helping them have a family. And this is a great webinar. It's a great topic. You could go on for hours and hours. And, and I really appreciate the input um, from, from both Bill and Klaus and to you, Nabil, for, for hosting us. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I have to say that we have enjoy your presence during the, your participation during the, the last webinars. You've been really a key opinion uh, a person in the embryology field and, and we really appreciate that. I, I hope you could still come from time to time to our webinar series. Yeah, I'll be around. Yeah. <laughs> can't, can't and, give it up. It's too hard to give it up. <laughs> very good. Uh, and you guys, you are amazing. I have really enjoyed talking to you about quality control and quality assurance. Uh, next week, we're gonna have a webinar on recurrent pregnancy loss, what to do next. Um, and um, with this, we are coming to the end of the webinar. If you wanna see the recording of this webinar, you can go to progenesis.com slash academy, and then you can watch the entire video. Uh, with this, I would like to extend my gratitude to all of you for your experience and I will see you next week. Thank you so much. Thanks guys. Thank Take you care, everybody. Thanks everybody. Bye.